Hello, I bring you peace and grace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we pick up our Bible study of the Gospel of Matthew with chapter 16, verses 13 through 23, which reads from the New International Version as such. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This is the word of God for the people of God. May God add a special blessing to the hearing of this word. Let us now go to God in prayer. Holy and almighty one, we thank you for this word. We ask that your spirit be with us to open our eyes, ears, hearts, and our minds so that we might receive your word and that it might transform us from the inside out. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, like virtually every passage we have studied, there is so much going on here. There's no way that we can get to all of it. So we'll have to pick and choose about what uh, we will focus on. Um, taking the last thing first, the part that we will not focus on so much, this contains the messianic secret again uh, with the messianic secret. Something that we see very strongly in Mark, which of course is picked up by the other gospels. And that is this idea that the disciples of Jesus and anyone who witnesses um, the uh, miracles uh, or the revelation of Jesus' identity should not share that with other people. And there's a variety of reasons why um, we think that that made its way into how the narrative of Jesus is told. First and foremost, because people are bound to misunderstand who Jesus is until uh, they see the crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. That that is the, the lens through which we look at the life of Jesus to understand truly who he is. Um, so anyway, uh, that is a part of this story. At the very end, Jesus begins to tell them about how he must suffer and die. Uh, Peter, strong, the, Peter strongly rebukes him, says, this shall never happen. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get, uh, get thee behind me, Satan. Um, a very strong rebuke to call his number one disciple Satan, uh, for you were focused on human things instead of heavenly things. And, um, you know, the, the, what we're supposed to take from that, of course, is that Jesus' ways are, are not our ways, and the ways of the kingdom are not the ways of the world. And despite our um, apparent insight from time to time into the ways of heaven, uh, that ultimately we're, you know, in a world and in a worldview that finds these things very strange and odd. Okay, so the part that I would like to focus on comes in the first half of that passage, and that is um, when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? You know, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And uh, we, we see that, you know, generally people, the population has a high view of Jesus. They say, you know, that he is um, Elijah or, um, you know, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. And then Jesus turns the question to the disciples and says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus commends him, says it wasn't flesh and blood that revealed that to you, but rather uh, my father in heaven. And then uh, he says, you know, you will be called Peter. Of course, Peter already has this nickname at this point, but he's interpreting his nickname. He says, you'll be called Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I shall build my church and you'll have the power to uh, loose and to bind uh, in heaven the things that you loose and bind here on earth you'll have the authority um, uh, you know that I, that I have and um, uh, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you so all right 
notice that this particular passage takes place in Caesarea Philippi. That's important. The reason that's important is because this is a city that has been uh, constructed in honor of Caesar, right? And Caesar, the head of the empire, the Roman empire that occupies this land, was called the son of God, okay? So when we hear a statement that Jesus is the son of God, other, in other words, that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the son of the living God, this is a direct refutation. This is a direct affront to the claim that Caesar was God. And it's a very dangerous claim, one that could probably get you killed, right? So the, the political implications of that particular proclamation should not be lost on us. Then he says that it is upon this rock that I shall build my church. The rock, of course, is associated with Peter, and Peter makes the correct confession that he is the Son of God. So what it means is that, number one, the church belongs to Jesus. Number two, that uh, Jesus will build the church upon this particular confession. And by virtue of building a church on the confession that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God, the church will have the same authority that Jesus has, which is primarily the authority to properly interpret the scriptures. Okay, so what that means is that not every institution that calls itself a church can properly be called a church. Uh, the church, properly understood, is any church that recognizes above the governments of men, above all of the wicked kingdoms of this earth, recognizes the authority and confesses the ultimate authority of Christ as the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, the Son of God. So any church or any institution, rather in word or in practice, becomes an institution of the empire of the day, whatever, you pick a century, you know, whatever the empire is of the day, then it is not a confessing church. Only the, only the church that recognizes Jesus as the ultimate authority, the only the church that recognizes the kingdom of heaven is the only place where we have our citizenship can properly be called the church of Jesus Christ. And the good news is that the authority that Jesus has uh, as being you know, more powerful than the kingdoms of this world, the authority that he demonstrates in his life to properly interpret the scriptures and so forth will be given to us, will be given to those of us who confess. Meaning that you know, the time in which the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom, kingdoms of this world clash are not confined to those you know, short decades of Jesus' life and the few short years of his actual ministry. That in fact, the triumph of the kingdom of heaven over the kingdoms of this world extends throughout all time until ultimately heaven and earth are consummated and come together. Uh, so that should be good news, meaning that if we are a confessing church that says very provocatively, you know, in, in the face of the governments of this world, that we ultimately do not recognize the kings and emperors of this world as the ultimate authority, but rather our God in heaven, that though we might draw persecution upon ourselves, that ultimately we will be vindicated uh, because that same authority that raised Jesus from the grave, the same power that was present in Christ, is present in our church today. All right, um, so I'll just kind of end with, with this brief moment. You know, we live in the United States of America, or at least probably most of you who are watching this, and uh, we don't suffer persecution. And if you know the, the inconveniences, the clash of ideologies that we have are count as persecutions, I think we do a lot of injustice for people who suffer real, real pain and suffering because of their faith. I think you have to go to you know, authoritarian, um, you know, dominated regions of this world, places, some places in Asia and Africa, um, you know, places where Christianity is seen as a legitimate threat to power and authority. And those places do exist. There's not many of them, but they're not the United States of America. I mean, we're pretty much left to, you know, do whatever we want. And our culture is very accommodating for Christianity, even a wide variety of that. Even when, you know, our beliefs and policies or laws don't line up, uh, there's, there's not a secret police knocking on our doors, arresting people, torturing them and killing them. But there are places around the world where that happens. And I think that 
um, you know, were the church to stand up and really be the church, you know, and not a, a, a hateful confrontational uh, institution by any means, but rather an institution that is um, uh, governed by love, that is governed by an unwavering faith, and a, uh, an institution that truly recognizes Jesus as the Lord of our lives, I think we would bring persecution on ourselves, um, if not from the government, definitely from the culture, um, because that's just not the way that it's done here. Uh, but that's okay, because uh, I think that ultimately, you know, as, as what is said in this scripture, that, um, you know, what we bind and what we loose here on earth will be bound and loosed in heaven. Uh, that we will be given keys of the kingdom, that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us. I think all of that applies and should be good news for us. All right, uh, that is all for today. I hope you have a wonderful day and until next time.